is mechanic acoustic coupling. I'll first show a few practical examples uh, of uh, application cases, then we'll go through the governing equation as usual, derive the finite element formulation for our uh, coupled problem, and then discuss how the discretized system looks like and what you have to be um, expecting when you um, model mechanic acoustic coupled problems. So let's look at an ultrasound array, for example. In this uh, case, we have a strong coupling between the mechanic field, this, the ultrasound array, and the acoustic field. Uh, so uh, the fluid has actually a strong uh, back coupling impact on the vibrating structure. On the other hand side, uh, when we look at the noise radiation problem from uh, a power transformer, for example, we have a weak or forward coupling. So the vibration behavior of the structure is not really impacted uh, by the surrounding fluid, which is air in this case. Um, so actually you could model this problem in a forward coupled manner. You first uh, compute the solution of the mechanic vibration problem, and then you um, apply boundary conditions and compute the acoustic radiation problem. Uh, this is not the case, for example, for the oil within the transformer. Here again, we have a strong coupling between a structural vibration problem and the fluid problem uh, within. So let's look at the mechanic acoustic uh, coupling um, in terms of the governing equations. First of all, we have two partial differential equations. Each is defined on, the, uh, on its own domain. So you can here see in the sketch, we have a structural domain denoted um, omega s and the acoustic medium uh, denoted omega a. Um, so in mechanics, of course, we have the balance of momentum as governing equation. And in acoustics, we have our acoustic wave equation. And they're co coupled at the common interface uh, denoted gamma here in the sketch. Um, and at the interface, we define coupling conditions. So we have a surface or interface coupling. This is the third coupling type uh, we're looking at in this course. Um, just to note, there are also some approaches that treat acoustics actually, um, acoustic media by displacement based formulations. Then you end up with the formulation that is based on the balance of momentum only. Uh, however, you have shear, zero, uh, zero shear stiffness in the acoustic medium, uh, which can lead to, to uh, numerical problems. Um, so we're not looking into this approach in this course. So how do we couple our equations now? Um, we need to do a few things. The first thing is we have to define a common normal vector at the coupling interface. Uh, so this is typically taken uh, to be the normal vector pointing out of the deformable structure. So we take the normal vector of the structure, uh, which is of course uh, minus the normal vector of the acoustic domain as our common normal vector. And then we can specify coupling conditions on the interface. Uh, and the last step we have to do, we have to insert uh, the interface terms into the weak form of the respective partial differential equation. We will soon see how this works. So what are the coupling conditions first? We have two coupling conditions. The first one is the kinematic coupling condition. Uh, and it basically uh, specifies the continuity of the velocity. Uh, so we have the acoustical particle velocity V in normal direction. So here we have the inner product with the normal vector uh, must be equal to the time derivative of the mechanic displacement U uh, in, in the normal vector. And of course we can take uh, the time derivative of this condition uh, and obtain the relation for the acceleration to. And the second coupling condition we have is the continuity of forces on the interface. So here we have uh, the stress tensor projected on the interface. So the mechanical tractions must be equal to um, the 
forces in the acoustic medium and they can be described by the pressure uh, times the normal vector. So pressure uh, and, and due to the sign convention of the pressure, there we have a minus here. And then from this coupling condition, we can derive relations for the respective acoustic formulation, which we will need to insert into the weak form. We'll see later in detail how this works. The relations are uh, actually derived from the derivation or are taken from the derivation uh, of the acoustic formulation we've done in the last lecture. So let's uh, dive into the finite element formulation for mechanical acoustic coupling. The first step, of course, is uh, we introduce a test function uh, for mechanics, so U prime, and for the acoustic problem, P prime, for each PDE. We multiply, we integrate over the domains, uh, omega S and omega A um, for the structure and the acoustic uh, problem independently. And then we can also independently uh, use the product rule and integrate by parts um, as for the single PDEs before, and we obtain the boundary terms. So these, the, these are the terms uh, we are looking at, the terms in green. Uh, in, on the mechanical side, we have uh, sigma in, uh, in normal vector. So this is our traction. And similarly, uh, in acoustics, again, we have the boundary flux, the gradient of the acoustic pressure in the normal vector. Um, so this is the, the standard uh, integration by parts. Uh, we have our boundary terms. Uh, and of course, we can split the boundary terms now, uh, as usual, in the uh, different areas. So the areas for um, the boundary of the domain will be neglected and we will only retain the areas um, for the interface. Um, what we can do then, uh, as I said already, split the boundary terms into parts uh, for Dirichlet regions, for Neumann regions, and for the common interface. Uh, and at the common interface, we can now introduce our common normal vector. So we have seen we'll need to use a minus sign um, at the uh, acoustic normal vector, since we use the convention uh, that n is equal to the structural normal vector. Uh, and for the sake of brevity in the following, I'll just um, neglect all the Neumann boundary condition terms, will, which will go on to the right hand side. Uh, so what we retain here is an integral over the common boundary gamma a s. So here again, we have our boundary terms. Uh, so sigma in N, we have to replace by something um, taken from the acoustic PDE uh, and gradient P in N, we'll have to replace from by something taken from the mechanical PDE and this will give us our coupling. So let's see uh, what the boundary conditions tell us. Uh, here we have the interface conditions for the acoustic pressure formulation, which we have looked at um, for the start. Here again, sigma in N, we have to replace by quantity from the acoustic PDE. And here we can directly see, we can use the dynamic condition where we have sigma in N is equal to min minus P N. So this we can directly plug in uh, and we have our first coupling term. Uh, and for the second coupling term in the acoustics equation, uh, we have you, we can use the linearized momentum equation uh, and project it onto the normal vector n. Uh, so what we get here now from the momentum equation projected in normal direction is um, the expression we actually need on the right hand side minus gradient p in n. That's the term of the boundary term, uh, and this is equal. Uh, to um, the time derivative of the velocity times uh, rho zero. Uh, and here we can use the kinematic condition uh, and equal this acceleration to the mechanical acceleration, which is, uh, of course, the second time derivative of our displacement vector. Uh, 
And again, we have an expression, we can insert, we can replace the boundary term by a quantity from the other PDE. So uh, the displacement quantity. So finally, we can insert the dynamic and kinematic coupling conditions uh, into the boundary term. Uh, and what we obtain here is the final weak form for mechanic acoustic direct coupled problems. Find u and p uh, for all test functions u prime and p prime such that our weak form is fulfilled. Now let's have a closer look at this equation. We have here, we can recognize here the standard uh, mechanic uh, balance of momentum in the weak form. And additionally, a surface integral um, where we have now a mixed uh, um, bilinear form. We have ansatz functions uh, or test functions from the mechanical PD U prime and unknown functions from the acoustic PD, uh, namely P. And similarly, in the second line, uh, the equation for acoustics, we have the standard weak form for the acoustic wave equation. And additionally, a boundary term where we have a mixed weak form. So we have um, a test function P prime uh, together with the unknown function U here in the second time derivative. So what we can do now, uh, we can, of course, do the same for the acoustic potential formulation. The only difference here is that uh, we replace first uh, the uh, P by the acoustic potential Psi in the wave equation, since the wave equation was the same for both formulations, uh, there's no difference. And then we have to use the adapted coupling conditions. They're given here again, um, you can uh, recompute those from the derivation of the um, acoustic uh, PDE in, in the potential formulation. And again, we can plug these in for the boundary terms, which are given here on the right-hand side. So one boundary term was minus gradient psi uh, in N, and the other boundary term was, as usual, sigma in N in the mechanic PDE. And what we'll see again, we have mixed bilinear forms that are created by an integration over the common interface. Again, test function from mechanics uh, and unknown functions from the acoustic PDE and vice versa in the uh, equation for the acoustic PDE, a test function from acoustics paired with an unknown function from mechanics. Note here that we have actually uh, symmetric bilinear forms almost uh, apart from uh, the uh, scalar uh, rho zero. So we have a time derivative in the unknown functions and uh, no time derivative and no differential, no other differential operator uh, in the test functions. So we'll quickly see what uh, this means for the discretized system of equations. So how do we get this discretized system of equations? Again, we can use standard nodal finite elements. We can introduce uh, uh, ansatz functions for the unknown fields, and we can apply our Galerkin procedure to arrive at the semi-discretized semi uh, system of coupled ordinary differential equations in time. So this is the standard finite element procedure. Um, and for the acoustic pressure formulation, uh, now we can see what we end up with. Uh, let's focus on the first line of the matrix equation here first. Uh, with in the degree of freedom vector, uh, we collect now degrees of freedom for the mechanic problem. So that's XU. Uh, and for the acoustics problem, uh, this, that's XP. Uh, again, we have a second time derivative. So we have an ODE system of second order. Uh, we have stiffness uh, ten, uh, matrix KU. Uh, we have a mass matrix MU. Uh, the same we have for the acoustic line, appropriate for the acoustic line. Uh, note that also I have added here um, a right hand side forcing vector, which we didn't have in the weak form, uh, but this arises as in the individual PDE simply from the boundary terms. And 
Additionally, we now have coupling terms in the stiffness matrix, so KUP. Um, this is one of the coupling integrals we've seen. And the other, the other coupling integral ends up in the mass matrix as MPU. Um, we can also, of course, write this in the standard form, take a global vector of degrees of freedom uh, and uh, we see now more, more precisely that we have um, an ODE system of second order. Uh, just note when you look at the mass and stiffness matrices, uh, they've become unsymmetric uh, due to the coupling terms. So let's have a look how this um, looks in the acoustic potential formulation. If we absorb, uh, observe the coupling terms there, we can see that when we multiply the wave equation by rho zero, uh, we actually make this coupling term symmetric. Uh, so, and uh, due to the fact that we have the first time derivative in the unknown vector, uh, which is now taken from the acoustic potentials for the, in the acoustic case, uh, we also obtain um, we obtain the uh, coupling matrices in uh, the damping matrix. So the matrix that is multiplied to the first time derivatives of the unknown functions. And uh, as I said already, they are symmetric. So we have, again, a second order ordinary differential equation systems. Uh, the system matrix have become symmetric and now they contain a damping matrix too. Uh, just note, the damping matrix does not provide any physical damping. Uh, since we haven't modeled any damping. Uh, we could model damping in the mechanic uh, problem by, for example, specifying Rayleigh damping. However, we have not done this. Uh, and uh, so in this formulation, the damping matrix has zero diagonal entries. Uh, so actually uh, it doesn't provide any physical damping uh, and only provides the coupling between uh, the degrees of freedom. How can we model mechanic acoustic problems and what is important for this? Uh, first of all, each PDE is defined on its uh, volume region. So uh, it's uh, like modeling the individual uh, PDEs uh, via the common uh, interface, which we have defined to define with the conforming mesh. That means shared nodes. Uh, we can uh, do the coupling. If you discretize your domain with finite elements, you should um, obey the discretization restrictions of each PDE uh, in the corresponding region. And then, of course, you have to um, make uh, the mesh uh, match at the common interface. And the output results are the same as for the original PDE. So there's uh, not much um, new to learn in this respect. Uh, just to note, there's also the so-called non-conforming grid technique um, that you can use to couple uh, domains uh, without the conforming mesh. This will be treated in the next course, next semester. Finally, let's look at the analysis type we can uh, study for the, the problem. Uh, these are basically um, given by the restrictions of the acoustic PDE, <clears throat> so we can do harmonic analysis in the frequency domain, we can do transient analysis, or we can do eigenvalue analysis. Just um, be aware that when you use the pressure formulation, um, the unsymmetric matrices require the correct storage, um, and uh, often special eigensolvers are used, uh, are necessary to solve eigenvalue problems with unsymmetric system matrices. Uh, the potential formulation, on the other hand, leads uh, to a quadratic eigenvalue problem, as you could have seen from the presence of the damping matrix in the ordinary differential equation system. Um, 